Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, first of all, I want to ask you a question. Why is there something rather than nothing? No, no, I don't want the answer. <laughs> I just want you to think about it. (laughs) I also want to uh, mention Cal, who led the spiritual session prior to this. He has been my uh, sponsor for some time, and uh, he has ruined this for me. (laughs) Because I can't say I. And I can't use words. (laughs) I was the... I think I'm just going to stand here for an hour. (laughs) In order to have uh, full transparency, um, I'm a professional Christian. Okay? Uh, I have been paid to teach and pastor and preach in the context of the Christian faith. So if I slip into some of my biases, I trust that you will forgive me. What I want to do is to talk about my experience in, uh, in coming to sobriety, and in the process of that, try to identify a few spiritual principles that I think apply to humanity, whether we, whatever religion we may be or whatever understanding of God we don't have. I don't understand God. I try to avoid using that phrase, the God of my understanding, because I don't understand God. And neither do you. (laughs) And neither do any of the wonderful people whose books you read. God understands us. One of my favorite lines is, If someone tells you they are going to explain God to you, run. (laughs) But I but I think I've I think I've rethought that. If someone is going to explain God to you, keep nodding and back away slowly. (laughs) You don't want to trigger you know, the chase. (laughs) I love my mind. And this will become clear as I get into my story. there was a point in my life when I was really considering being an academic. I loved the intricacies of thought. 
And I think it's important that we do that. Okay? The God of my understanding means that we're trying to work with our intellect. And I'm enough of a rationalist to appreciate that. But I've also come to the point where I have deeply, deeply recognized that it's not going to take you anywhere. Isn't that fun? <laughs> you have to do it knowing that it's useless. <laughs> Important. So, okay. I was the third born and only surviving child of my parents. Their first child, my eldest brother, died at 10 months old. And then my mother had a stillborn child. And all she ever wanted, all they ever wanted, was a child. Ta da! <laughs> you can begin to see where this is going. <clears throat> I was the basket in which all the eggs were kept. I was somewhat overprotected. And part of the reason for that was that at two years old, I walked down to the corner of our street and crossed the highway and got on a bus. <laughs> and the bus driver said, well, there were four women there and I assumed that he belonged to one of them. <laughs> But after he had gone around his route a couple of times and realized I was still there, <laughs> he dropped me off at the police station. And my parents had phoned the police, and they came to get me at the police station. And it was typical Hollywood. There I was, sitting on the sergeant's desk with a police hat on and an ice cream cone. Between two and five... I had two life-threatening scaldings. I was run over by a car driving my tricycle across the street. And I had a life-threatening bleed when I was having my tonsils out. So by the time I was five years old, my mother lived in a constant panic. Then I went to school. <clears throat> Today I would have been diagnosed as ADHD. I was one of those kids that the teachers, when they got their class list, was praying that I wasn't on it. <laughs> and it was, you know, I did the stupidest things. I love this guy. I really appreciate the folks who are doing the signing. I mean, that's just... Do you have any sense of how much energy this takes? Yeah. Part of what happened was that I was very quickly given the message that I was dumb. Okay. I remember being used as the bad example in class. Okay. Teacher said, this is how you do it, this is how you don't. That was mine. 
So I literally realized that I could never live up to my mother and father's hopes and dreams for me. That I was always going to be a failure. That I was never going to measure up. Now, I've been ordained coming on close to 50 years. <laughs> That, that's not an accomplishment. I mean, I just stayed alive, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in that time, I probably, I haven't calculated it out, but it's over 2,000 sermons and addresses and stuff. Never one as big as this. I'm an AA virgin. <laughs> so I expect you to be gentle with me in your evaluations. <laughs> My point is that I shared with our home group here in PV that I was terrified of doing this. And they all said, oh, <laughs> you do this for a living. And I said, yeah, and every Sunday I'm terrified. And you see, it's because in my heart of hearts, I still don't measure up. When, we, when children are shaped within the first seven, eight years of their life, that never goes away. Have you ever seen pictures? I don't know where it is, and I can only describe that it's a windswept area of the world where the prevailing winds seem to only blow one way. And there are trees that grow there that instead of growing straight, they grow bent because the wind keeps blowing them in the same direction all the time. And those trees cannot be straightened out. You will ruin them if you do. And I will go to my grave with that inner message that I do not measure up. But you know what? Those trees are amazingly beautiful. Anybody else here feel like you don't measure up? All that gnarliness in you is what makes you beautiful. It's one of the things that I've come to understand. One of the spiritual principles is that your wounds are what make you beautiful. And God will use those wounds to heal others. So here I was, coming into my teens, oh boy. And I hung around with my cousin because I didn't have any friends of my own. And they tolerated me because my, my job in the gang, I mean, when I was 14, this is how tall I was. My job in the gang was to put on someone's overcoat so I'd look a little older and go in and buy the booze. Now, I'm sorry, even with an overcoat, a 14-year-old kid does not look 21. <laughs> and I only ever once got carded. And he just smiled at me and said, you got any identification? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, go away. And so every weekend we would drink and go to the weekend dance and make trouble. 
And that was what I did because I didn't measure up. It allowed me to fit in in some way. And then there was a party. And that party, I think, was a New Year's Eve party, but it was a somewhat of a disaster. And the girl that I was dating at the time was uh, uh, getting rid of me. And, the, um, and one of our friends had passed out in the snow. Now, you, you understand I come from Winnipeg, great place, but passing out in the snow is not a good thing. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, we, we have a, an organization in Winnipeg that walks the streets at night looking for people who are sleeping in doorways because it's, it's lethal. The cold is lethal. So I went out and dragged him in, and I got mad. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. If you guys want to destroy your lives drinking, go ahead, but I'm not going to help you. And they said, oh, that's all right, Bobby. You'll feel better in the morning. But I didn't. And somehow there was a change in my life. And I started tailing around after a girl who wished I would go away. Unfortunately for her, she wound up marrying me. <clears throat> and this was, this was a turning point. Now, there are two other things that, um, that go way back, as far back. I mean, I have memories from two years old. That's, uh, I gather that's not all that unusual, but... And there were two things for as far back as I can remember were true for me. One was that I had a sense that I was never alone. Now for a little kid, that's a bit freaky. Because I didn't have a faith-based family, so nobody talked about this spiritual stuff. And, and I just knew that I was never... There was always this sense of presence. Can't describe it any more than that. The other thing I knew is that I was different from other little boys. I didn't like knocking people down. I didn't like investigating what happens to bugs when you pull their wings off. And I never had any words for it until I got into my adolescence. And then the words were things like pansy, fag, queer. I like the word queer now, by the way. I think it's a great word. So when I was chasing around this girl, it was because I was hoping it was going to go away that if I hung out with a girl and we necked and we did those things that maybe this would go away. It didn't. And I was in a program that we called commercial. We learned how to type and how to take shorthand and those kind of things. Because the teacher who hated me and the feeling was mutual uh, asked me in grade nine, what do you, what do you think you're going to do, Webster? And I said, well, I don't know, go into business, I guess. And he never told me about commerce or any of those sort of things. He said, ah, go into commercial, that'll suit you. So in grade 11, I had an exam on Monday morning, left school Friday and forgot my textbook. Couldn't get into the school. Went there Monday morning as early as I could get into school, grabbed my textbook, looked at it, memorized a bunch of stuff that were lists, 
went through the exam, found those things, answered them, and I got this remarkable grade. First experience ever that I could learn that I wasn't dumb. And I wound up that year getting an average of 79.5, and lo and behold, some teachers went to bat for me, which was unusual in my experience, and they said, when we get a .5 mark, it always gets rounded up. This guy gets an 80 average, which means honor certificate. My parents came to graduation astounded. <laughs> First time they had ever had anything to do with me and school that was positive. Went into grade 12 and had a remarkable English literature teacher who inspired me with a love of English literature and I wanted to be an English literature teacher. But my courses wouldn't allow me to go to university. So I went back to grade 10. Did high school all over again. And I decided that this time I was going to do it right. I was going to do everything I hadn't done before. I went out for sports. I was a little heavier in those days. And I was going out for the football team. And I saw the coach seeing me coming, and he's going to his assistant coach. <laughs> so we were running some scrimmages and this sort of thing. And every time I knocked someone down, I'd check to see if they were OK. <laughs> And this one time, I really hit a guy and sent him flying. And when the thing was over, I went running back to see the coach who had hair about that long was pulling it out. <laughs> and he was screaming at me, Webster, don't apologize. Hit him again. <laughs> I realized that that wasn't the sport for me. So I played volleyball. <laughs> All of a sudden, oh, one of the things that I had not done before, one of the things that the, the good kids in school did was they all belonged to a church youth group. One of, there were several very large, I mean, those were the days when we had 80, 90 kids in our, our youth group. And I decided I was going to take part in that too. I was president of the school, president of the youth group, I had a lead in the operetta. I had a 12 to 15 hour a week job on the weekends. And I was pulling down top grades. My parents were black and blue from pinching themselves. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was the model child. Way down inside, this little voice said, Nah, you don't measure up. And I thought, I've accomplished it all. I'm everything I wanted to be. I'm everything my parents wanted me to be. And Peggy Lee's song came out. <laughs> Is that all there is? And I thought, there's got to be something more. And that opened me, of course, to a faith conversion. For those of you who understand this, I came into that conversion through the charismatic movement. And I won't, it was one of four times 
that I encountered God in a way that was transformative. We were in a prayer group at a youth conference, and without getting into all the details, all of a sudden, Jesus was right there. My apologies to non-Jesus people. For me, that's who it was. And if I thought if I open my eyes, I'm going to see him, so I kept my eyes shut. The encounter with God is so transformative. The power of that love is so overwhelming that it's not by mistake that when people encounter the holy, they fall down on their face. It's terrifying. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So if you encounter the divine, don't be afraid. Just allow it to take hold of you. Remember all the stories? When angels appear to people, someone talking about angels before, the first words out of angels' mouths every time is, don't be afraid. Not going to wipe you out. (laughs) But you will get transformed. The second time was when I was trying to figure out, okay, you know, I'm a Christian. (laughs) How am I going to live my life as a Christian? I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. So I made a list of all the things that I could do. You know, there's a whole variety. I could be a teacher. I could be a social worker. I think I could even be a doctor. Or, um, I could be a business person and give a lot of money to the church. I could, you know. And there was about seven or eight things that were real, real possibilities. And the pros and cons. And all of them pointed to the same thing. They're all equal. Any one of these. Now, I learned two things out of that. Well, let me, let me just say, this is, this is the other time that, that God would, you know, there's the, the, the voice in your head, and you'll recognize it because it tells you things you'd never say to yourself. Okay? And the voice said... I said, God, what am I going to do? It's all equal. I mean, I could do any of this and live for you. I don't know what to do. And the voice said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a priest. And the voice said, so? Now I learned two things. One is that being a priest is no big deal. It's just another ministry. And that everything you do in life is a service to your neighbor and to God. Whatever you're doing these days with your life, you are serving God. So I got ordained. Also got married. Remember that girl back there? Yeah. The common wisdom in my day was that if all those guys need is a good woman. And I got one of the best. didn't work. And it just made me aware that in yet another way, I didn't measure up. But that's a secret I could keep. 
Nobody needed to know about that part. And if I worked hard enough, maybe God would take it away. If I was faithful enough, never worked. Life went along. We had a couple of kids, and one of the, my gay acquaintances at one point said, well, you must be bi because you had children. And I said, no, when you're young and horny, you can fuck anything. <laughs> not the way I normally talk on a Sunday morning. No. <laughs> but it was true. And our sex life tailed off fairly quickly. We were married for 27 years and in the last 15 had never had any sexual. And one of the deepest pains in my life is that when Tannis and I finally came to have the discussion, she thought there had been something wrong with her. One of the deepest wounds for me is that I did that to her. So Tannis and I you know, I, I did, by the way, you know, remember that party? I didn't bother with drinking anymore until I was 21, and then social drinking. And then Tannis turned 21 a few years later, and we, we drank, so we were social drinkers. We really were. I mean, except that every once in a while, Tannis and I would be at an event, there'd be an open bar, and I, around 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.30, I'd say, um, I'm going to get a drink. Do you want something? And she'd go, no. And I thought she had a problem drinking. <laughs> what I realized now is that, of course, her body was having a normal reaction to poison. My body never, ever, ever said that's enough. Hey? Anybody recognize what I'm talking about? <laughs> never told me that. Now, that didn't mean I overindulged regularly, occasionally, but like everybody else I knew. And the agonizing, hey? You're only as sick as your deepest secret. Everybody heard that phrase before? Yes? I think it's fairly common. And this continued to rage within me. And I began to realize that the only way out was to off myself. And I would save the church the embarrassment of having one of those priests. And I would save my family the pain of having to live with this shame. I had it all pretty well worked out, and I was about ready to implement the plan. And, I, you know, have you ever been aware that you can separate your mind while you're doing one thing, something quite opposite can be going on at the same time? So while I'm planning to take care of this, I'm also continuing to pray. And I had some sense that there was something wrong going on here. And I said to God, I'm sorry. 
I don't see any way, I don't see any other way out of this. Remember that voice? The voice said to me, don't you know that I've always known who you are? And I went, oh, well, yeah, I guess that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> and don't you know I've always loved you? Revelation. No matter who you are, no matter what secrets you have, no matter what pain you're bearing, you are a beloved child of God. Utterly treasured beloved. Spiritual principle number one. Love is the foundation of it all. Remember I asked you, why is there something rather than nothing? You ever tried to imagine nothing? Try it sometimes. It's, it's, it's intriguing. It's, it's kind of interesting. What I have come... And this is biblical, okay, for, for folks that are, you know. By the way, if, if, you, if you're part of a Christian background and you're upset by some of the things I'm saying, apart from fuck, <laughs> 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 that, that's not cursing, that's just vulgar language. And, you know. <laughs> but if you're, if you're concerned about my theology, <laughs> see me afterwards and we'll talk. Okay. I mean, that's serious. There, there's, there's, there's issues for folks. In Psalm 139 in the Bible, the Jewish Scriptures, there's a guy that's trying to get away from God. And everywhere he goes, everything he does to try to escape, God's already there. The source of everything that exists is, is what we use. I mean, we use the term God. Not because it's a good, helpful term. It doesn't tell us anything. But it's our language, and so we're stuck with it. Unless we're going to do what Cal told us and not talk at all. You're not going to get away for a long time on this one. <clears throat> you understand what I'm getting at? There, are, there is a reality to existence that cannot be without the source of existence. Yes? Okay. And that source of everything that is shares being with us. Not because being has to share with us, but because being loves us so much. Loves because being loves. Being, you know? And because being loves, being has to create and share and each one of us exists in the foundational existence of all. See, if God was to withdraw being from me, I wouldn't die. I would just cease to be. Poof, gone. Not even a little pile of dust. Because you exist, you are a manifestation of the love that the universe shares because the foundation of all things and everything is love.
God. Yay, God. <clears throat> so here I am, suddenly realizing that I'm a beloved child of God. I mean, I always had those words, but now something had happened. And the process began, all the coming out. And by this time, you know, progressive disease? You all familiar with the term? By this time, that line somewhere had been crossed. And I didn't know it, I did, still didn't know it, but I was using alcohol to numb the pain. And when Tannis and I decided that the best thing for us to do if we were going to remain friends is to live apart, pow! All of a sudden, as one of my friends put it, I was a 50-year-old adolescent having to navigate all the relationship pitfalls that go on that you're supposed to sort out in your teen years. His other favorite phrase was that all of a sudden you're like a kid in a candy store with a credit card. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, thank God for Al Anon, because the two in our church organizational structure, we have two lay people who are the official representatives uh, in the congregation. And we call them wardens. <laughs> wardens just means keeper, right? Okay, so, but it has a special connotation. And it, in this case, it was probably closer to that connotation. They had both been married to alcoholics. One had been very active in Al-Anon, and they both recognized that I was in deep trouble. Just one little example. I mean, I thought I was still doing okay. I mean, I was showing up and doing things and managing to produce a sermon every week. But we had this meeting. There was a family in the congregation who wanted to have their husband, father interred in the churchyard. Ashes, but, you know. And so I talked to the wardens about it, and we discussed it and looked into things and decided, no, that that was not a good idea for a whole variety of reasons, some of them legal. And somehow that went away. And I said to the family, sure, we'll put the, put the ashes right here, right under the rose bush you're going to plant on top of it. I have no clue how that happened. But that was the final straw for them. Because then, of course, we had to disinter Okay, which from the daughter's perspectives was fine because she got to keep, keep daddy on the mantle. It wasn't her mother's favorite idea, but never mind. So they went to the bishop and said, this man's in trouble, you need to do something. And he said, I'll take care of it. This was June. In October, nothing had happened. They wrote letters of resignation to the congregation and sent copies to the bishop with a covering letter saying, we told you that there was trouble here and you haven't done anything about it. We're backing off. It was a real gut punch. But I knew that these two people loved me. So I thought, okay, there's something going on here. And the bishop called me in, and 
we decided I was going to do in this program, and they sent a report, and then he sent me to a counselor who um, I had a very nice sexual relationship with. <laughs> and he sent a report back. <clears throat> And then I did a program, and during this time I thought, okay, I'm, you know, if this is a problem, I'm going to stop drinking. And in a period of about six months, I had one glass of wine with dinner twice. And it was fine. I didn't have a problem. And I was doing this program on alcoholic problems, right? And at the end of it, the woman said to me, did you drink during this program? And I said, yeah, I had one glass of wine twice with two different dinners. And she said, well, you're probably an alcoholic. <laughs> and I thought, bitch. <laughs> two lousy glasses of wine separated by weeks? Of course she was right. I cheated on the program. You were, we made a commitment at the beginning that you're not going to drink during this time. And I somehow thought I could get away with this. And so then I, the bishop put me on three month medical leave. And I took a program at the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba. It wasn't a red a uh, residential one. It was uh, a day program. <laughs> i got to share this. I mean, just to give you some, uh, some idea of my mental state at the time, I went to one of the meetings with uh, a T-shirt that I thought was really funny. And it was um, some animals running out of a log that was being screwed by a big moose. <laughs> And the caption was, sometimes when I drink, I do strange things. <laughs> Does anybody in the world think that's a good t-shirt to wear to a program like that? I got sent home. <laughs> At the end of the program, I still did not believe that I was an alcoholic. I was fine. I, w I had, during this time, I had also engaged in a lot of spiritual healing, counseling. I, you know, I thought I had it. To I really had it together. So we were going out to the beach. My now husband and I. We're going out to the beach, and some friends said, we're having a barbecue. Why don't you stop in on the way home? I had been healed. Okay. I didn't need to drink anymore. I could... I was fine. And this was going to be a safe place. This was going to be all gay men. So I didn't have to be afraid of anybody finding out who I was, because I still wasn't out yet. And I thought, I'll have one glass of wine with my hamburger. <laughs> Drank to blackout. Thank God. When I woke up in the morning and they told me what a wonderful time I had had and I couldn't remember any of it, I couldn't explain to myself, never mind anybody else, I couldn't explain to myself why I hadn't stopped at one glass. And I remembered the phenomenon of craving. I'd been in AA enough to hear some of these things and I realized that that was what was happening to me. I just got a wind-up sign. <clears throat> I 
Long story short. <laughs> I went back to AA, and with a lot of help from a lot of people, I have managed to stay sober, largely because I reconnected with that voice, presence that had always been there. So, the spiritual principles. Presence. Practice the presence of God. Be, you've heard people talk about how they encounter things. Just let yourself be aware of a presence. However you understand that, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, it's... You use the word God or not. It's a reality that we encounter in life that sustains us. Embrace your powerlessness. The best things that happened in my life were when I acknowledged that I was powerless to do anything about it. First step. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. Love requires vulnerability. And if we're going to engage that love that brings us into being and sustains us in life, we have to be prepared to be hurt. Understand that healing and wholeness does not mean perfection. Healing, I still believe that I don't measure up at some little core down in my insides here. But I don't let it run my life. I recognize the lie that is implicit in it, even though I can't eliminate it. So don't worry about not being whole. Just recognize that you are beloved in the midst of that. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I do want you to understand that our experience is the source of our strength and hope. It's one source of our strength and hope. And that the more we experience that presence, however it comes to us, the more strength and hope we have. And whenever... I think I have to do something and I go to God and say, I don't know whether I can do this. God says, look, how long is it going to take for you to recognize that you are a beloved child of God? And I say, Oh, but if you really knew what I was like. <laughs> and God laughs. And then I laugh. And then we just sit together for a while. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.